Well, rogue CNN hosts aren't the only people taking the side of Antifa. Two professors, one at Stanford, the other at Purdue, are working to create what they're calling a campus anti-fascism network. It's national. It says its goal is to, quote, drive racists off campus. Laura Beth Nielsen is a professor at Northwestern University. She supports the creation of this network, and she joins us tonight. Thanks a lot for coming on, Professor. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. So I want to take this seriously because I think it's a serious matter. Um, so first, I just tell me what, what the point of, of this network is. Well, I should say, just to be perfectly clear, I'm not affiliated with the um, the CAN network, the Campus Anti-Fascist Network. I, um, I'm a scholar of free speech and campus hate speech and those kinds of issues. So I looked at their materials and I think their purpose is to try to, or what they say their purpose is, and I don't have any reason to disbelieve them, so is to, um, to help scholars of political theory, political science, and history to develop the kinds of courses about the history of fascism, to help college students make sense of what they're seeing in the news today, and to try to interpret what's going on politically. Okay, so um, I, I love the term scholar because it so rarely applies to people who work in colleges, I've noticed. I went, I went through the syllabus to this and I read a lot of the pieces on here. Here are some of the titles. U.S. Cops and Klan, Hand in Hand, Star Spangled Fascism, We Charge Genocide, Right Wing Populism and Awakening Fascism, Anti-Semitism in the White House under Donald Trump. So. Th th those are not scholarly articles. A lot of them are on just left-wing uh, websites, political websites. But I decided to take it seriously, and I, as I said, read one. And here's the piece on anti-Semitism. This is why this piece and this syllabus by the group you're supporting says Donald Trump is an anti-Semite, because he gave a speech saying this. Workers in the United States are making less than they made 20 years ago, yet they're working harder. We've seen the firsthand in the WikiLeaks documents, Hillary Clinton meets in secret with international banks to plot the destruction of American sovereignty in order to enrich these global powers, her special interest friends, and her donors. That piece says that that phrase is anti-Semitic. It holds that up as evidence that the President of the United States is an anti-Semite. That's insane. That's not scholarship. That's, that's, just, that's just lunacy. Tucker, I don't know the article that you're referring to. I should say that the syllabus that they've put up is open source. Anyone can go on there and add an article. One of the things I like to teach my students at Northwestern is how to evaluate well, not if something is scholarly not or not. So is it a peer-reviewed? No, it's a set of ideas of scholars who are trying to talk together about how to organize these classes. But there's no scholarship. But that's, have the, that's the point. There's no is scholarship. That a peer in reviewed, that. Is that a no, peer reviewed? Is that a peer reviewed publication? Okay, no, so none then, of, nothing I'm on the syllabus is it? peer reviewed. Are it's you just, sure? Yeah, I'm positive. At least the, the six ones on the there that I got. There's nothing the American Political Science Review or not the Journal on the one of American that I had. History. Not on the one that well, I had. So As here's the invitation I letter would teach for the peer reviewed. Yeah. Okay. Well, you're defending it without even looking at it. So it has this. No, it says I that I'm quoting it. I looked at now. it this afternoon. Oh, okay. Then maybe maybe we're looking at something different. I, I think I was looking at the same thing. And I'm quoting now. This is from the invitation letter to this group. Since Trump's election, fascists, neo-fascists, and their allies have used blatantly Islamophobic, anti-Semitic, racist, and ableist messaging and iconography to recruit their ranks and intimidate students. Their, their allies? Who does that mean? It seems to me like they're tarring anybody who voted for Trump as a bigot. No, I think what they're trying to say is that what you just reported is an or read from the letter is an empirical question. As scholars, we want to know if that's true. We want to look to the research about hate crimes and about incidents of hate speech and try to understand if there's something no, going on it is in true. this moment. Right? Right, they are. And what I would say is that's an empirical question. The um, FBI keeps hate crime statistics. I would take my kids right to look at those. Those were linked on there. So were the so, um, Southern Poverty Law Center. Wh um, what's the ableist messaging and iconography that Trump supporters are engaging <laughs> I, in? Like, what does any of this I, mean? Like, it's so nonspecific that it, it just seems like pure political propaganda to me of the least impressive kind. Do you not see that? I mean, well, I don't see any scholarship in here at all. And I read the whole thing. 
Well, I, I would say there's definitely a place in political theory, political science, and history for understanding the roots of fascism so that we can understand if we are having a fascistic moment and what anti-fascism is. And one thing that I see quite a bit right now is a conflation of anti-fa or anti-fascists and anarchists. Anarchists and anti-fascists are different political philosophies. Anarchists don't believe in order. They're out there doing street violence. They, and maybe they're being incited, and we could talk about the free speech issues with that. But being anti-fascist means that you don't support a totalitarian government that bases loyalty, crushes opposition on the basis of nationalistic racial identity. Yeah, I that's what's so, that's so silly about all of this is that, look, it, whatever you think of the administration, they're not crushing opposition. In fact, opposition has grown in a way that we've never, we haven't seen in my lifetime in this country. So if it's a fascist government, this is the beginning of a fascist movement, they're doing a pretty bad job of it, aren't they? Well, I think there has been, uh, there has been an increase in um, uh, hate crimes and hate speech towards different groups that you mentioned since the election. It's pretty well documented by both the FBI and the Southern Poverty Law Center. Okay, I mean, whatever. of All course, right. that's not Americans, Scott. Now it's the know. Southern Poverty Law Center. I mean, you know what? If you're going to, like, I'm a professor and I'm a scholar, and you cite the Southern Poverty Law Center, that's so self-discrediting that I, I, I don't know what to say to that. I mean, that's not scholarship. Well, you could replicate it. As a social scientist, you could replicate their research. They put it's it out there. It's not research. The it's, it's, it's political propaganda. I read it every single day. It's like one guy's opinion working out his political beliefs. There's no scholarship in that. Go to the website. Well, if you I, think that's scholarship, I think you, then I don't want to send my kids to your school. I guess that's what I mean to say. No well, offense. I'm sorry. But it's I just do not. think that most, okay. I think it's really important to emphasize that most Americans Okay. are anti-fascist. We yes, have a history of fighting fascism. The American uh, military was involved in World War II. That was violent anti-fascism, defeating Hitler. Um, and so insofar as there's a discussion right. about if that's where we're moving politically, okay. students need to understand the history of it. Don't, okay. it wouldn't, seems, don't you want yeah, them to Yeah, they can learn the history of World War II, but this just seems totally hysterical to me. But, I, okay, we're going to have to leave it there. We're out of time. Professor, thanks for coming on. Oh, sure. Yep. Well, fired FBI Director Jim Comey may have meddled in last year's election even more than we already knew. Republican Senators Chuck Grassley and Lindsey Graham say they have found proof that Comey was drafting a statement exonerating Hillary Clinton of criminal wrongdoing in that email investigation even before the FBI finished the investigation or even bothered to interview Hillary. Tom Fitton is the president of Judicial Watch and he joins us tonight. Can this be true? It's incredible. Uh, it shows the investigation truly was a sham. You know, Comey came out and said, well, he made the decision in July. Well, his deputies were interviewed uh, by government officials, and they said, well, he began drafting the statement in early May, maybe even early as April, before they had interviewed 70, 17 key witnesses, including Clinton. And remember, they gave immunity to all those witnesses, and everyone was outraged. And now we know why they gave immunity, because they weren't going to prosecute anybody. Why? get in the way, uh, why let uh, uh, testimony or grand juries get in the way of this uh, sham investigation? So just give everyone immunity and just proceed. A Potemkin investigation. I'm really fascinated by this part of the story, which I can hardly believe is true. There's evidence apparently that the FBI helped pay for the dossier on Donald Trump, the Russian dossier that was published ultimately in BuzzFeed. Can that be right? That's right. They started paying, it looks like, the expert behind the uh, behind the dodgy dossier. During the campaign. Right. During the, the campaign. The FBI helped pay for oppo research on Hillary's opponent. That's right. Uh, and the firm evidently... Do we know that's true? Well, we're trying to get answers about that. And we asked the FBI for documents about any payments they made to the author of the Trump-Russia dossier. And they came back to us and they said, we can't even confirm or deny whether any such documents exist. So I, I don't know who's running the FBI. Well, I do. But it's certainly not someone with the interests of the American people in terms of getting some transparency about the misconduct of the FBI during the Obama administration as they were working to really nail Trump uh, through this uh, really uh, awkward and, let's put it this way, conspiratorial relationship with the authors of the Trump dossier. Well, if that's true, you hear all this barking about fascism, fascism's coming to America. You know, it's armed organizations like the FBI, for which I have respect, 
But if it turns out they're this corrupt, you know, this is where you, this is stuff you should worry about. This is this I is think. this is a two for story. You've got Comey protecting Hillary Clinton while targeting Trump at the same time. That's the intervention in the election we need to be investigating. And if I were President Trump, I'd order the DOJ to do an audit of what the FBI and Justice Department were up to last year, including reviewing the handling of the Clinton investigations, and yes, the handling of his investigations as well. He's a victim here, but the American people are too, because they were abusing the political process even more so than any Russians were. Well, I don't even want to believe that, but if it's, I'm shocked by it. Thank you, Tom, for that. You're welcome, Tom. The Southern Poverty Law Center is not a simple nonprofit trying to protect America from extremist hate groups. Not at all. CNN says it, but it's not true. The organization is complex and is trying to shelter cash in the Cayman Islands. A lot of it. We'll take you through the SPLC's finances next. The Southern Poverty Law Center, which is focused on neither the South nor poverty nor the law, weirdly enough, aspires to be America's supreme arbiter of what is and what is not a hate group. Plenty in the media have been happy to treat them that way, despite ample evidence the group has an overriding political agenda, an agenda that distorts all it does and makes it deeply dishonest. Well, now documents obtained by the Washington Free Beacon reportedly show that the SPLC, which is officially based in Alabama, has been offshoring millions of dollars in assets to accounts located in the Cayman Islands, because that sounds legitimate. Joe Shopstall is the writer at the Free Beacon who broke the story, and he joins us tonight. Joe, why are they sending money to the Caymans? I cannot answer that question. I tried to get it from them, but the accountant hung up on me. Uh, they did not respond to numerous requests for comments. Uh, we can't really speculate on that. Uh, Wait, their accountant hung up on you and you asked the that question? The person who prepared the forms, I called and I was like, I'm looking for the foreign forms. Yeah. Um, and I thought you would you'd think the account, because most accountants, even Clinton's accountants, would hand over forms. She just said, I don't comment on clients and hung up the phone. What, what are the possible reasons you would, if you're the SPLC and you're basically America's moral judge, okay? Mm -hmm. Why would you be offshoring money to the Cayman Islands? Is there a good reason to do that? That I can't, I cannot answer that question. Because it's already a nonprofit, correct? It's already a nonprofit, exactly. So the reasoning behind it, I couldn't speculate on, but it just, it's, it's unusual. A lot of people that I spoke to said it was very unusual that they were sending millions of dollars to the Cayman Islands. They have interests in the British Virgin Islands as, as well as Bermuda, but we could only find a segment, the 2014 numbers that show the five million. So there's other segments like they have the British Virgin Island, Bermuda. We don't know the amounts on there. They also have ownership in foreign corporations, but each corporation that they have ownership in, they don't meet the threshold of ownership to report it on a form, a tax form. It's a little confusing when you look at these numbers, $328 million in net assets. The, yes. Why would the Southern Poverty Law Center amass more than a quarter billion dollars? They make all their money it's from, it's from the hate industry. They What they do is, in the 1970s, they served a legitimate purpose. They, they won a lot of landmark civil lawsuits for civil rights. And flash forward to today, you have them, they swing far left. They're known for the hate map, as you know, which contains conservative groups, mainstream conservative groups, along with actual racists like the KKK. And this turned into a windfall for them. Their, uh, their leadership, uh, the top people in management, they average probably around $300,000 in pay. $328 million? I mean, if you really care about making America a better place, why wouldn't you give that money to the dispossessed or marginalized communities of color, the ones they're always talking about? Another great question. Okay. They only spend 61000 on litigation as well, being a law center. Yeah, it's a totally fake organization. So thanks for your reporting on that. Thank you. Well, the SPLC supposedly exists to fight hate groups. Now it's also turned its attention towards statues, which being non-living, of course, don't hate anybody. They can't. They have no souls. They're made out of plaster and marble. The group has published a map of every single Confederate memorial in the country, from statues to army bases to middle schools. Tyler O'Neill is the assistant editor over at PJ Media, and he joins us tonight. Tyler, what's the point of this list? Thanks, Tucker. I think the point of this list is so they can defame organizations with which they disagree. They like to label groups hate groups. 
They put the Family Research Council on there, Alliance Defending Freedom, D. James Kennedy Ministries. These are Christian organizations who believe in traditional marriage, that marriage is between a man and a woman. And that's the reason why they're listed as hate groups. Right. It's ridiculous. So here's what, here's what their uh, press release says. More than 1,500 Confederate monuments stand in communities like Charlottesville with, quote, with the potential to unleash more turmoil and bloodshed. It is time to take them down. That sounds like a threat to me. It certainly does. The worst thing is that they put middle schools, elementary schools, high schools on this list. No student deserves to have to go to school in when there's a violent outbreak of protests. No student deserves to walk to school through rocks, through well, of course. Maze being I mean, of course. Flown. So that's exactly I mean, right. If you to go to protests. Stonewall Jackson Middle School, and the Southern Poverty Law Center is saying bloodshed might result because the name of your school, that's ominous. It's very ominous. It's terrifying, and no student, no kid, should have to go. Has there been that. any pushback at all? So there are three lawsuits that are going through the system right now: D. James Kennedy Ministries, uh, the uh, Liberty Council, and yep. then there's one more from uh, actually a Muslim, a Muslim who's been targeted by radical Islamic terrorists and has spoken out against them. His name is Majid Nawaz, and he's been listed he's as a an anti-Islamic extremist. He's one of the bravest and most articulate people I've ever met. And the fact that the Southern Poverty Law Center, morally bankrupt, fraudulent in every sense, is calling him a hater is really an outrage. An anti-Muslim extremist. Yeah, a guy, a, who, a guy who grew up in Islam. I hope he wins that suit. Tyler, thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you, Tucker. Well, a lot of people are struggling in America, but can we all spare some concern for investors? They're hurting, say some. Up next, we'll talk to a nonprofit head who's trying hard to preserve a tax break that helps investors, but nobody else. Plus, we'll give you the latest breaking news about the situation in Houston. Flooding there is still causing devastation on an enormous scale. We'll have the latest. It's no secret by now that America's middle class is in trouble. If you're wondering why our politics are so confusing and intense, that's why. In the past decade, their earnings have stagnated, their savings have dwindled, their debts have grown dramatically. The investor class, though, has done really well, really well, better than any group of people has ever done in world history. Nothing wrong with that. But they've collected almost all the income gains since the end of the 2008 financial crisis. They're not a bad group of people, but they're not necessarily in desperate need of help. Seton Motley is the president of Less Government. He just wrote an op-ed for Town Hall arguing for the preservation of the carried interest tax loophole, which overwhelmingly benefits investors and is being considered for elimination as Congress works on a tax reform bill. Seton Motley joins us tonight. So, look, I don't think anyone's going to argue that getting rid of the carried interest loophole is going to balance the budget or anything. Yeah, it's like There's $11 no. billion, dollars, that, 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 which is exactly DC right. money is nil. But can you see why it's infuriating for wage earners? I earn a high wage, really high wage, but I'm still a wage earner. I don't have any investments right. or anything, even for me. And I'm like thinking, like, well, wait a second. Here's a guy in private equity or running a hedge fund who's paying literally half the tax rate I'm paying. Why is that fair? Well, because a lot of the money he's managing is our money. And it's, it's long-term investments by people like us who'd like to retire at some point in our existence. And we invest now to retire later. And when we collect, right. when we collect that, when we start cashing out what we've been investing, I'd like to not pay the income tax rate all over again. I find the capital gains rate infuriating in toto because you earn the money, you pay income tax, you pay social security tax, you pay Medicare tax, you pay property tax. And then if you have any left over after rent and groceries and you happen to invest some, and then you're going to get crushed all over again when you cash well, you're out. Not getting crushed. I just find that infuriating. You're getting, uh, look, I'm not for higher taxes. I, taxes are too high. Yes. But it's a relative measure, okay? So someone who's in private equity or running a hedge fund is paying on the money he makes, not money he invests. These are, in some cases, these are performance fees, okay? Right. He's paying half the tax rate but we, because he's in a job that has very effective representation we know here in Washington. We know what's Lobbyists going to, did this. We know what's going to happen. There is no one in government half as intelligent as the people on Wall Street. So whatever blunt force instrument government tax rate you want to apply to them, 
they're going to find a way around it just as they've yes, done. No, that's right. Just as they've done with these or fees and all of that. Then, right. Then why not? Then they'll just, follow the solar panel. Well, how about a flat order. tax? I mean, here's what I'm No, I know. I'm, uh, I'm off. Why do we tax capital? At half the rate of labor. Because we want to incentivize people to invest in our oh, economy. Okay, but what about working? Because our tax rate reflects what we think is virtuous and what we think is sinful. That's why no. we tax cigarettes and we subsidize solar panels. You, you know the freak show that is, uh, and I'm forgetting his name. Uh, I know a lot RT. of freak shows. He's on RT. Uh, but anyway, I was on RT arguing with this guy, and he was arguing for equal rates between capital gains and income tax. And I said, fine, lower the income tax rate That's fine. to the capital gains No, but rate. I'm for that. Look, just yeah. to be totally clear to our viewers, I'm not arguing for higher taxes. Right. What I'm arguing for is fairness. If my neighbor inherits a bunch of money and stays home all day smoking weed, tending to his portfolio, and I get up in the morning and go to work, he pays half the rate I do. I don't is mind. he contributing twice as much to America? Is he twice as good a person no, as I am? But, like, but, what is this but, anyway? You're arguing from a leftist perspective here. No, I'm not. I'm arguing saying, from a fairness perspective. Well, it, well, Why is it fair that I'm I'm life is life no, is, because working, life isn't fair. I'll, I'll life is impartial. No, working is virtuous. Working is dignified. I, I couldn't agree more. It is good for people to I don't work. Want the government we shouldn't to, punish it. Well, I, I'm not. Well, then let's lower the income tax rate. I'm totally for but, that. But I don't want to fall into the leftist trap argument, which is beat the hell out of the rich because they inherited money. No, but or whatever. you're missing it. I'm not saying beat the hell out of anybody. I'm saying. Stop discriminating against people who get the hell out of bed in the morning and work. That is a dignified well, then, thing to well, no. do. We have a huge class of idle rich people. We do. Then I know. And I can I'm not imagining this. No, okay? what I was saying was you and I can walk hand in hand out of this segment saying lower the living daylight out of the income tax. I'm, I'm totally agreeing with that. What I don't want to do is fall into the leftist trap of, of viewing capital investment as something that's bad. Be, be, I'm for capital investment, right. but will people stop telling me that it's twice as virtuous as working? That's well, what well, really you're, 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 infuriates you're, you're, me. You're, you're, you're imposing virtuousness onto what the tax no, rate is. No, because our tax code actually reflects our values. Again, why, does, why do cigarettes cost 20 bucks a deck in New York? Because we think smoking is immoral. That's what we tax the and, hell out and, of. And conversely, if we want people to invest and save, which is what we all say we want them to do, why do we want to increase the, 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 the capital gain that, on, on, but all on the All I'm savings. saying is working is every bit as good. I would argue maybe even a little better than investing. It's good for your soul. It's good for the country. It's good for our middle class. Which I is think I think somebody who's day trading and, and investing a lot of money all the time yeah. and creating wealth for people to then go in and say, I have a small business idea. I need a loan. I think those people shouldn't be viewed as inherently bad just I'm because, not they're, just because I'm not they're, attacking not, they're not working in the just traditional saying, let's sense. Appreciate Oh, I'm, I'm, uh, listen, right. I live in I live in blue collar heaven where I live. So no, <laughs> no. don't get me wrong. I'm, I got plumbers and electricians all around me. I'm Amen. a huge fan. Yeah. Seen Motley. Great to see you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Well, Black Lives Matter activist says the best way for white people to fix racism is to give all their stuff away to black people. We'll talk to a BLM supporter about that demand and the rest on the list of demands from Black Lives Matter. Stay tuned.